I ran for president because I believed the policies of the previous decade had left our economy weaker and our middle class struggling. We came into office with a different view about how our economy should work. Instead of tax cuts for millionaires, we believe in cutting taxes for middle class families and small business owners. We've done that. The policies that the Republicans are offering right now are the exact policies that got us into this mess. A perfect example uh, is the debate we're having on taxes right now. And what I've got is the Republicans holding middle class tax relief hostage because they're insisting we've got to give tax relief to millionaires and billionaires. Here's the difference between us and them, he's saying. Here's the difference between the parties. If you think the government should be giving billionaires more money and making all the rest of us pay for that, there is a party for you. That's the other guys. If you think government should instead prioritize the needs of the middle class, you think maybe billionaires are doing okay for themselves, then you want to vote Democratic. Oh, election season. Election season, the time when someone reminds Democrats to do what Republicans do all year long, every year. The time to make the distinctions between the parties sharp. The time to make clear and stark the choice between voting red and voting blue. Now, you can do this locally for any individual political race by talking about the difference between two candidates. He's a bad person. She's a good person. Uh, she's dishonest. He's honest. Uh, but at the national level, when you are a national leader, it's not just one race. And if you have any appreciation at all for national dynamics driving local races, which they totally do, you've got to make clear the difference not between two people, but between two political parties, between the two parties approach to the country, what each party stands for. And sometimes pictures help with that. I will now show you the prettiest picture that Democrats could ever hope for this election season. It was done by Catherine Mulbrandon of Visualizing Economics. On the left, what we will see here, there we are. Uh, those numbers represent percentiles of wealth in this country for families. How rich you are, in other words. At the bottom, you'll see it's the 20th percentile that's like the Tom Jodes, the bottom of the heap, the have-nots. At the top, the 95th percentile, that's like Daddy Warbucks, right? Richie Rich. That's them that's got. Um, across the bottom, the x-axis there, yes, those are the percentages for annual growth in income. And it turns out that your financial health really does depend on who's in charge. Because look at this. These lines represent the growth in income for each different economic group uh, under all the Democratic presidents since basically the end of World War II. If you are further down the ladder, if you have less money, your income grows a little bit more than if you were at the top under Democratic presidents, but only a little. Everybody grows by pretty similar amounts. Okay, so this is, un this is blue under the Democrats, under Democratic presidents in aggregate since the end of World War II. Now let's look at what happens when Republicans are in charge. Oh. This is what happens. Just look at that. When Republicans are in charge, people at the bottom of the economic scale hardly get anywhere. Their incomes grow at an aggregate of 0.4%. But the top income bracket, the Daddy Warbucks bracket, their incomes grow nearly five times faster than that. In the middle, they're just muddling along, wishing Bill Clinton would come back. And, and, and this is not you know, rich versus poor. This is not a class war thing. People in every income bracket do better, as you can see, when Democrats are in the White House. The, the richest, the poorest, the middle class, whatever. Between World War II and 2005, which is what this graph represents, everybody did better under Democratic presidents. Under Republicans, if you're rich, you did pretty great, particularly compared to everybody else. Because if you're anybody but the rich, Eh. This graph covers 1948 to 2005. It is actual observed performance. It is not what the parties are pledging to do. It is what they have done economically. So when you hear the fight now over whether we ought to spend $700 billion as a nation giving more tax cuts to the richest 2% of people in the country, which Republicans want to do and Democrats don't want to do, here's why we're having that debate. Here's why. Here's how. They mean it, man. They are committed. A picture is worth 700 billion words. Joining us now is Ezra Klein, staff writer for The Washington Post and MSNBC contributor. It was on his excellent blog at The Washington Post where I found this graph this week. It's from Timothy Noah's epic series on Slate.com about income inequality in America. Ezra, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, this has been a long, long been a dream of mine to animate and act out graphs 
Do you, do you think we adequately... I dress up, as, I dress up yeah. as a graph on weekends. There's nothing to be ashamed of here, Rachel. <laughs> yeah, but you always dress up as a pie chart. I know you're kind, Ezra. Uh, do, you, do you feel Fighting like that words. graph it is important in terms of understanding the difference between the parties writ large? Uh, of course. I mean, the easiest way to deal with it is to look at what we're talking about right now, the Bush tax cuts. There are two plans on the table. Barack Obama says, you know, we should have the tax cuts, except that we should let the part for people over $250,000 expire. The Republicans say, absolutely not. There is no way we can let massive tax cuts for people making more than $250,000 expire. That is a critical part of our economic agenda. And that really matters. Uh, earlier this year, part of this George Steinbrenner died here in New York, you know, it. He didn't have to pay, or his heirs didn't have to pay any estate tax at all, any at all, because of the Bush tax cuts. Democrats don't believe that. They think that enormous wealth gets taxed when it moves from one generation to the other. And as you would expect, when you make massive decisions like that, people become richer and poorer at different rates. Well, what is? What are the kinds of policies? that have the biggest effect on whether there, whether there is a middle class or whether we're just very rich and very poor. Is it tax policies mostly that make the biggest difference? We're going to need so many graphs. <laughs> um, a, a lot. Look, there's the long-term stuff, right? Education, things like that. And then there is the stuff that isn't policy, right? The tech boom helped make a lot of people richer. It did a lot in the 90s. But yes, tax policy is a huge uh, part of this. I mean, it really is. Everybody knows they pay taxes and it matters. It changes their income. And, and what's important here is that, particularly in the last 30 years, as Timothy Noel points out, the rich have gotten a lot richer. The top 1% now get 18% of the nation's income. So 18 of every $100 this country gets an in income goes to 1% of the people. And if you decide to lower their tax rates, at the same time their incomes are racing up, and they're racing up to 18% of every $100 of income, that really changes the income distribution. It has an enormous impact, not a small one. I think people sort of sh shove this stuff off to the side a bit. They don't imagine the numbers are this big. Sort of really appreciating our inequality is hard for for people to do. But we are really unequal. And when we decide to make those folks richer, then they, they then get more power to affect the political system. And it happens again, and it becomes something of a cycle. You see, you see this in countries that are usually not America. But right now, we're seeing it here. We did see a fight uh, at one point in the last presidential debate about whether or not it's kosher to even care about economic inequality. That whole brief fight that we had about the redistribution of wealth and how that's this horrible idea. It hasn't actually been the argument as in, in as overt away, I think, from the right since Obama has been president. But I, but I imagine it will come back at some point in this tax fight. And so I also want to ask you about that, that fight, about the top 2% and those Bush tax cuts. There is also this argument that's coming down about those, that it's not just about the effect on income inequality. The rich should have tax cuts. The rich should have as much money as possible because that's really good for the economy overall. That's stimulative of our bad economy. What do you make of that argument? Well, there are two parts to that argument. One is false, that that's a great way to do stimulus. It is, and very few people seriously think it is. The ones who do aren't terribly serious people. But what people do say is that in the absence of a Republican Party willing to allow better forms of stimulus, maybe we just need to do what they will let us do, even if it's a really bad way of doing stimulus, because that will help. And that's rougher. I mean, what they're basically saying is, um, give us what we want or we shoot the economy. So we get bad stimulus and it makes it rich richer, but it's better than nothing. People have to decide that. Wow. Ezra Klein of the Washington Post, um, helping us with pictures and with words. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ezra. I appreciate it. Thank you.